Let's begin with today's date, November 7th. Ring a bell in history? November 7th, 1917, the Bolshevik Revolution. I, I mention it, for starters, for a reason. Because, happily, it is fading history. And as we talk tonight, and Jews have this propensity, in case you haven't noticed, to gravitate towards the bad news and the challenging news, because perhaps we have a genetic predisposition. I want to remind us that occasionally there's good news to frame the bad news. And the good news comes about not just because we wish for it, because people have acted. So in 1974, I was invited by the US government to go live in the Soviet Union. Now, you can read that in a couple of ways. <laughs> so the obvious question is, did they give you a one or two-way ticket? <laughs> they did give me a two-way ticket. <laughs> and there I was, 25 years old, one of the early fruits of detente, arriving in the Soviet Union in September to go and teach in the Soviet educational system for several months. And then came November 7th, 1974, and the entire Soviet universe entered the streets, decked out in red with slogans, long live the proletariat, and all of that other stuff. And in the midst of all that were literally millions of Jews, and perhaps some of you here tonight, or those you know, who were trapped behind the Soviet borders in that Bolshevik, Leninist, communist vortex. And who would have imagined in 1974, as I watched these millions of people marching with the Soviet military might on display, that in the year 2013, no one would even remember what November 7th was. And thank goodness for that. And then comes November 9th and 10th, this Saturday and Sunday. And it marks the 75th anniversary of what is, in a way, inappropriately named Kristallnacht. It's actually more formally named by us Reichspogromnacht. Because Kristallnacht, the night of the broken glass, doesn't quite convey the power of the depravity of what happened on those two days. And I don't have to tell you what ensued after the 9th and 10th of November 1983. You know it at least as well as I do, if not better. And I don't have to tell you that had the world reacted more forcefully even then, who knows whether history might have been different, but it happened, and we know what happened, and we can't undo what happened. But as with November 7th, some seemingly improbable things have happened since then. And one of them is tomorrow morning that the German consulate in New York, the German mission in New York, invited AJC to join together in marking the 75th anniversary of Reich's Pogrom Nacht. And we accepted. And tomorrow morning, a gathering of this size, I'm told, will meet where the German flag flies today in the German house on 48th Street and 1st Avenue opposite the UN partnering with AJC to commemorate this anniversary and to stand together in affirmation in 2013 of common values and aspirations built around democracy, human dignity, respect for history, and an affirmation of the German-Israeli special relationship. 
I say that because extraordinary things can happen. And even as we discuss our tsuris, and don't worry, I'm getting to it soon. I don't want to disappoint. I want us to keep in mind what can evolve. What can evolve? And the third thing I want us to, to keep in mind, even as I mentioned the name Israel, is the fact that in 1938, during November 9th and 10th, as you know all too well, there was no Israel. And even when Hitler was teasing and baiting the world, you like the Jews? Take them. Take them. Take them. November 1938 was before Auschwitz was built, before Birkenau was built, before Belzitz was built, before Chelmno and Majdanek and Treblinka and Sobibor were built. Take them. The world didn't want us. There was no Israeli flag flying anywhere in the world. There was no sovereign state of Israel. There was no law of the return, a law of return. And here, in 2013, we forget the Soviet Union. We work together with the Federal Republic of Germany in New York tomorrow while Noam Marins pursues that work in Berlin tonight. And by the way, we'll be speaking in one of Berlin's main churches this weekend, having been invited by the church to reflect on the meaning of Kristallnacht to a German audience, to a German Christian audience. And we celebrate Israel 65 years. Extraordinary things have happened and can happen and I believe will continue to happen as long as ordinary people aspire to extraordinary outcomes. So we have some challenges, and we have a group of people here tonight at Temple Israel. Each of us is in our own way both extraordinary, of course, and at the same time ordinary. None of us carries the title of president of a country or chief of staff of the armed forces or head of the IMF, or Secretary General of the UN, or for that matter, even a US Senator or Congressman. In that sense, we're ordinary people aspiring to do extraordinary things against the backdrop of what other ordinary people have done. And what are those challenges? Well, for me, one of the challenges continues to be whether Israel will be a secure nation, fully participatory in the community of nations, safe in its borders, at peace with its neighbors, or not. Now that depends first and foremost on the ordinary, extraordinary people of Israel who are on the front line of waging the efforts. But there is, I've always believed, a second front. The second front is a global front. The Israel battle is not only an Israeli battle. The Israel battle is a global battle that needs to engage each and every one of us who cares about the well-being of the rebirth of the state of Israel in our lifetimes and who will simply not accept not accept the stark reality that the UN General Assembly adopts 22 anti-Israel resolutions each year, including this, we expect, and four resolutions involving all the other countries of the world combined. We cannot accept it. We cannot accept the fact that the United Nations so-called Human Rights Council in Geneva, not only does not offer Israel membership to participate in its deliberations, but in its standing agenda has a separate permanent agenda item, number seven,
dedicated to an Israel deemed guilty from the get-go. By the way, no other nation in the world has a separate agenda item. Not North Korea, not Syria, not Iran, not Venezuela, not the Congo, not Zimbabwe, let me go down the list. Only Israel. Only Israel has a permanent agenda item that deems it guilty and worthy of separate periodic review while other nations go too often scot-free. We cannot accept it. It may be the current reality, but we're going to do our darndest to ensure that it's not the future reality. And we're not going to accept, I believe, those of us who are friends of the state of Israel, and I might add, no less, friends of the truth. Those who would wish the world to believe that Israel and Israel alone is the source of the conflict in the Middle East. I don't know how many times I've heard in our AJC diplomatic meetings, whether at the UN in September or around the world, how many times I've been told, taught, lectured, instructed, Mr. Harris, don't you understand? If only we can solve the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, we will bring peace to the entire Middle East. After which, a comment like, and why doesn't Israel want peace? And why won't Israel compromise? And why won't Israel make concessions? And in the world of frontline advocacy, which AJC is engaged in, you have to be ready with a response which is not your gut response. Your gut response essentially wants to say, are you out of your bloody mind? Do you have a clue what you're talking about? You think that you want peace for Israel more than Israel wants peace for itself? You think that the people of Israel have lived for 65 years in the absence of peace? True peace? Real peace? And revel in it? You think that the people of the Shoah, the Jews from Arab countries who were forced to leave, the Jews from communist countries who were expelled or persecuted, have all come to the land of our ancestors, to the land of the prophets, in order to live in perpetual conflict? You need to teach us, the authors, of lo goy el goy cherev, lo yimadu and milchama, you're going to teach us that nations should not lift up sword against nation, nor shall they learn war anymore. You're teaching us? And you want to tell us, Mr. or Mrs. Minister, Mr. or Mrs. Prime Minister, Mr. or Mrs. Ambassador, that you really believe that if Israel were at peace, or heaven forbid that Israel did not even exist, that 120,000 Syrians would be alive today and not dead, whether by chemical weapons or the old-fashioned way, conventional weapons. Do you really want to believe that the Sunni-Shiite conflict, which is being played out before your very eyes, in which you saw the outburst of Saudi Arabia, for example, pointing a finger at the United States and, say, and saying, what are you doing about Syria? And what are you doing about Iran? You think that would go away? Magically disappear? Sunnis and Shiites would live in harmony from now till eternity? Do you really want us to believe, Mr. and Mrs. Minister, that what we've seen unfold in Egypt would magically disappear and Egypt would rival Sweden on the Human Development Index and the Human Freedom Index if Israel were only not a, quote, problem. Do you really want us to believe that? Do you really want us to believe, Mr. or Mrs. Minister, that the UN 
Arab Human Development Report, which has been issued several years since 2000, and which speaks about a freedom deficit in the Arab world, a gender deficit in the Arab world, a knowledge deficit in the Arab world, would magically disappear because Israel is the source of all the problems in the Middle East. Mr. and Mrs. Minister, stop reading your foolish talking points. Please, respectfully, open your eyes and understand what's going on here. Israel is a country that was born to seek peace. Israel is a country that more than once has attempted, perhaps more than any other nation on the face of the earth, to risk its own security in the sake of peace, but not peace at any price. Not peace at any price because Israel does not live wedged between Norway and Sweden. Israel lives between Syria and Mr. Minister, imagine if President Assad were not targeting his own people but targeting Jews. How would the picture look, do you think? And Mr. Minister, Israel's wedged between a Hamas-run Gaza. Mr. Minister, have you read the charter of Hamas any time recently? This is not AJC making it up, Mr. Minister. Please read the charter of Hamas and then tell me what part of it don't you get. That's Israel's neighbor too. And Israel's neighbor too is Hezbollah dominated Lebanon. Mr. Minister, have you read Hezbollah's mission statement? Have you listened to Sheikh Nasrallah on the subject of Israel and the Jews? That's Israel's geography too. And yes, Mr. Minister, there is a country called Iran which does not have a border with Israel and yet has a beef with Israel. It doesn't like the fact that it exists. And whatever we may or may not see in Geneva tomorrow, and now we're told that maybe we'll see something in the talks, the outlook of the Iranian leadership has not changed with respect to Israel, which the supreme leader, and let's be clear who are the players here, the supreme leader has called this week a bastard regime. This week. I'm not talking previous weeks, prior to diplomacy, prior to the charm offensive, but the guy who's got the ultimate power, Khamenei, this week called Israel a bastard regime. That's the reality. We wish it weren't. It is. And now 8 million Israeli citizens are simply not prepared for the convenience of others to uh, to go quietly. It's been a long journey back to Israel, and this time we intend to stay. And say we to the world, Israel represents the only outpost of our common humanistic values, our common democratic values. Is Israel problem free? Of course not. Have any of you driven in Israel? I'm not sure I would yet compare service in Israel to that of Singapore Airlines. <laughs> okay. And uh, we have a Knesset with 120 members and what, 17, 18, 19 political parties. Not the most efficient political system in the world, taking democracy to the nth degree. And yes, we have a cabinet where, unlike the American cabinet, no one necessarily thinks that a price of admission is to agree with the prime minister. So yes, once again, we've got challenges in Israel, big challenges. But let's put them all in perspective. So we've got real issues to deal with still on the global advocacy front before we can declare victory and say Israel is safe, secure, at peace, and normalized in the community of nations. We have other problems. Tomorrow, I believe, the European Union is going to issue a report by its own working group called the Fundamental Rights Agency, FRA, FRA. And that report, and we've gotten an advanced copy of it, 
is based on interviews with over 5,000 Jews in eight EU countries. And those eight EU countries comprise 90% of the Jewish population of the EU today. And you know what that report's going to show? Let me give you some sneak previews. It's going to show that 22% of all European Jews will no longer go to an event like this. They will not go to a Jewish event. They will not go to a Jewish space out of fear, not out of apathy, out of fear, fear. 22% of Europe's Jews say that they will not go to a Jewish event of any kind out of fear. The report will say that more than 40%, 40 percent, four zero, of Jews in France, Belgium, and Hungary alone have or currently are considering emigrating because they see no future for themselves as Jews in the current climate. And one quarter, if I recall correctly, have said that they expect to be the target of an anti-Semitic incident in their countries in the next 12 months. One quarter. And there's more along these very depressing lines. So my question to us is we can't change the numbers. We can't drive the numbers down simply by wishing the numbers to be driven down. But as with the challenges facing Israel in its region and the world, what do we, you, we, caring, committed, passionate, proud Jews, blessed to live in an America today, which may not have responded adequately to Kristallnacht, but certainly stood up when it came to rescuing Jews in the Soviet Union and Ethiopia, and certainly has stood up to defending Israel in the international community on so many occasions, what do we do with this information? What do we do with it? We can't pretend we don't know it. I've just shared it. It'll be out tomorrow. It's going to be in the press. It's already been in the Times of Israel, and it'll be in newspapers all over Europe and elsewhere. What do we do with this information? How do we sleep at night? Just as I ask myself, how do we sleep at night, knowing that the United Nations, with all of its noble goals in its charter, has singled out Israel for unique systemic structural discrimination. Ladies and gentlemen, what do we do with this information? What do we do with the information knowing that there is a regime building ballistic missiles and at least until now enriching uranium and reprocessing plutonium that calls the state of Israel a bastard regime? What do we do? And I know that each of us from our study of Jewish history of the 20th century says to ourselves, if only, if only we could rewind history and have a second go at it. If only we could know then what we know now, both about the news and about what works and doesn't work, maybe something could have been different. But in a way, that's a vain effort. We will never know, no matter how many times we replay it, if we could have found the key to unlock FDR's mind on the subject of rescue. We don't know. We will never know. And in some respects, it's almost a narcissistic exercise. We only know one thing, that we are proud Jews and there are other Jews in trouble. And the question becomes, what's our relationship to them and to their challenge? 
And here my appeal is that as individuals, there are things perhaps some of us can do. We can write to our senators, write to our congressmen, we can travel to Israel, we can teach our children and grandchildren about what animates us and what makes us proud as Jews and as Zionists. And each of those things is important, and there's much more, of course, that individuals can do. But if we want to engage the world and move the needle, and move the needle the way that the, the needle was moved on the Soviet Union and the millions of Jews trapped there, or on the building of the state of Israel and its protection and defense, not to mention its flourishing in so many fields, we're the army. There is no other army. There's no other army but the people sitting in Temple Israel tonight. And in venues like this, there's no other army, it's us, or it's no one. And in order to engage those global actors and those global issues, often transnational, cutting across countries, we have to stand together. And not only stand together symbolically, but act together and act smartly. I've learned in advocacy over many years, it's not enough to be right. You have to get those who have the power of decision making to agree with you that you're right. So for me to go around and convince myself that Israel is on the side of peace or that the United Nations is violating its own charter by discriminating against the state of Israel or that Iran does threaten the state of Israel or that anti-Semitism is on the rise, it's not enough to convince myself. I've got to go and convince the people who can make a difference and change, change those policies. That's where AJC comes in. That's where AJC comes in. What we're offering you is a global platform that begins right here in Bergen County and cuts across the state, the country, and the other countries around the world, and that in a way elevates each of us from individuals to a powerful, national and global force. I individually cannot meet the Prime Minister of Greece. I know that. I can't meet him to discuss the Golden Dawn neo-Nazi party. I can't meet him to discuss building a strategic partnership with the State of Israel. I cannot meet with him to discuss how he will steer the EU, of which he becomes the president on January the 1st. As an individual, I've got no access. But AJC knows Antonis Samaras for the last 25 years. He's our email buddy. We meet him several times a year, privately, in Athens, in New York, in Washington. And we meet his foreign minister and his defense minister. And I can go around Europe and around the world and offer you similar examples. We're offering you a global platform which says, Together, we can move the United Nations. Together, we can stand up for Israel. Together, we can confront anti-Semitism as it rises and threatens European Jewish communities, not to mention what's going on in the Muslim world on the subject of anti-Semitism. Together, we have a chance. Alone, we don't. And I will conclude by offering a couple of examples of what that togetherness can achieve. This past summer, the EU, at long last, after too many years, took a step forward. And it designated the military wing, so-called, of Hezbollah as a terrorist organization. We would have wished for the entire organization, but we'll take what we can get and keep going. That did not happen easily. I could spend hours going through each of the 28 EU countries. And the AJC advocacy, usually quiet, unheralded, that went into each of the 28 countries. Some were quite easy to convince. Others, not easy at all. 
but how it was achieved. And that came on the heels of an earlier HAC effort, a successful effort, to help persuade the EU to put Hamas on the EU terrorism list. Now you might say to yourselves, well, it's so obvious, what's the big deal? Well, let me tell you what's obvious to you is not necessarily obvious to each and every one of the EU member states, whether for reasons of politics or business or diplomacy or, yes, fear and intimidation. Some countries were not eager to go down this road with Hamas and even less so with Hezbollah. But we did it. Japan today is one of Israel's leading business, economic, and trade partners. But it was just a few years ago that Japan adhered to the Arab economic boycott against the state of Israel. Do you know what it means when the world's second or third largest economy essentially shuns Israel, cuts it off from most of its technology and trade? The Japanese foreign minister in 1995 publicly said, when asked, why did Japan change its position? He responded, and to me, this is the essence of who we are and what we do. And someone earlier said, give me the elevator pitch. Well, let me offer the elevator pitch given by the Japanese foreign ministry. On the record, the Japanese decision to end its adherence to the Arab boycott against the state of Israel came about because of the patient, perseverant diplomacy of AJC, which took the time to understand how Japan works. One sentence, and it comprises everything we need to know. The patient, perseverant diplomacy, because these decisions don't happen overnight. Governments don't turn on a dime, not on big issues like this that took the time to understand how Japan works. Remember what I said, it's not enough to be right. You have to convince the, the target audience why they should agree with you. And we were able to find the right arguments to convince the Japanese government, not just why it was in AJC's interest, or not just why it was in Israel's interest, but why it was in Japan's interest not to allow itself to be blackmailed and intimidated by an Arab boycott threat. And you know what? The Japanese dropped their adherence. The Arab threat to boycott Japan fizzled within minutes. And now Japan has the benefit of a robust relationship with, Japan, with Israel and an equally robust relationship elsewhere in the Middle East. And one final example, if I may, before closing. You may remember on September 23rd, 2011, President Mahmoud Abbas formally submitted a letter to UN Secretary General Ban Ki-moon asking for full membership in the UN of the State of Palestine. That request was, as is traditional, handed over to the UN Security Council. The 15 members of the UN Security Council had to deal with that request, which would have given the so-called State of Palestine equal status in the UN to China, Russia, the United States, France, Italy, Brazil. The United States could have vetoed it. But it said, and I think rightly, let's try and stop it with a broader group of nations in order to show the Palestinians that it's not just we, the United States, friend of Israel, that opposes their bid. Now, to stop the bid in the UN Security Council, you need a blocking group of, of, uh, of uh, seven nations. So you need. In other words, nine countries to vote yes to pass, nine to six. So to block it, you need at least seven. Through the collective diplomacy of the United States, Israel, and the help of AJC, we reached a point where it was eight countries in favor and six opposed to the Palestinian bid. And the whole process came down to one country, 
that probably would not figure on your list of top 10 power brokers in the world. And that country was? Bosnia. 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 It all came down to Bosnia. And frankly, I think since uh, <clears throat> a certain event happened in Sarajevo in 1914, I don't think there's been as much attention paid to Sarajevo slash Bosnia as we saw in 2011, when everyone from every side was besieging the Bosnian government and in the terminology of um, social media, becoming their BFF, <laughs> right? Oh, Bosnia, my favorite country in the world. I've always wanted to come here. I've been thinking about investing. I love the Bosnian people and culture. Yesterday, they didn't know Bosnia existed. And now I'm going to finish the story, but in the words of Congresswoman Nita Lowy, senior Democrat, lives in Westchester, who knew the story because she heard it from US government sources. So I'd rather that it be in her words than in mine, though same version. The Bosnian foreign minister sat in the office of AJC in September of 2011 as part of our annual diplomatic marathon, the opening of the UN General Assembly, when we, AJC alone, this little diplomatic engine that could, had 84 separate meetings with presidents, prime ministers, and foreign ministers, 84. By the way, John Kerry this year had 59. <laughs> Not that we're in competition, of course. <laughs> and his name was Sven Akalai. And we sat in the office and we were presenting him with our talking points on why it was in his interest, you know, the smart advocacy. And I could see he was kind of listening more or less patiently, but he wasn't fully engaged. And I'm saying to myself that sort of tell all Jewish word, oi. <laughs> and when I finish, he looks up and he says, okay, but I have some news for you, David. We, Bosnia, had a civil war from 1992 to 1995, you may remember in which the Muslims were targeted by the Serbs, in which ethnic cleansing was coined as a new term of reference. And at the time, said he, I was the Bosnian ambassador in Washington. And I remember vividly that you, AJC, stood up for us, stood up for our human dignity and our human rights, though you were not Bosnian and though you were not Muslim. And it was probably at some risk to you, but you did it. And not once, but again and again. Said the foreign minister, you stood up for us in our hour of need. This is your hour of need. We will not support the Palestinian bid. The Palestinian bid was defeated. They did not get the ninth vote. The next year, because some of you will say, but wait a second, something did happen. And you're right. The next year, unable to become full members, the Palestinians then went for observer status, a secondary status. And that they got, and that we couldn't collectively prevent, because that went directly to the General Assembly. And in the General Assembly, where you have 193 member states, if the Palestinians say the moon is made of green cheese, guess what? but they couldn't get the full membership. And it happened because at a time when there were probably some Jews who said, why is AJC speaking up for the rights of Muslims in Bosnia? After all, are we really friendly with Muslims? We saw an act of ethnic cleansing that didn't sit right with our Jewish values. And we felt the need to speak. We could not have visualized that 20 years later, what happened happened. But in smart advocacy, you're always thinking that when you make a friend and you keep a friend, maybe one day they'll become an even better friend. The problem in the UN is not the United States. I mean, you know that, but let me emphasize it. 
it's not for any lack of desire on the part of the United States, whether under President Bush or President Obama, to, to change the things that I've spoken about. Uh, not at all. But the power of the purse only goes so far. Because the reality is, and we need to understand this, the UN is nothing more or less than the conglomeration of its member states. That's who the UN is. The UN today is the 193 member states who comprise the UN. So if, if, if the United States withdraws its funding, um, it doesn't necessarily compel the majority of nations to say, that's terrible. It may more likely compel countries like Saudi Arabia to say, how much was the United States contributing? Here's a check. And by the way, you want proof? Egypt. Egypt. We thought, and we said so, that the United States made a mistake in suddenly withholding military assistance to Egypt. Let me be clear, we're under no illusion that Egypt today is a Jeffersonian democracy, okay? That's not the issue. The issue, in our view, is that today in Egypt, you have two choices, not three. You have a choice between the Muslim Brotherhood or the military-backed regime. One day we hope that there will be a third alternative, which embodies a secular civil society that will embrace democratic values and emerge. But that's not happening today. So why in the world would we want to diminish the military-backed regime, which is pro-Western, pro-American, supportive of the peace treaty with Israel, anti-Hamas, and why would we want to hurt them? But the moment we started to pull, the Saudis came along and said, uh, to whom do we write the check? And what we think is a lot of money to the Saudis was peanuts. And they brought the money. And by the way, if the Saudis didn't bring the money, you want to know who else is online? The Russians. The same Russians who are spending tens of billions of dollars in Sochi to create the world's best Olympics can also write a check today for a couple of billion dollars and displace the United States, perhaps. And finally, I want to offer an example, a real example. UNESCO. Know what happened there? The United States withdrew from UNESCO because UNESCO offered membership to the state of Palestine. We couldn't stop it. So we withdrew. Bravo to the United States. But has UNESCO closed? No. Have the other members rethought their vote? No. Is the state of Palestine out? No, it's in. And we're now faced with the stark reality that the best friend of Israel is out while the others continue to pursue their UNESCO efforts. So in reality, these issues become very complicated. But my, my point again, whether you like President Obama or not, or whether you like President Bush or not, these administrations, and we work closely with them, are Israel's best friends in the UN. Our problems are elsewhere. I think pound for pound, there are no better friends of the state of Israel than uh, Stephen Harper. The, uh, the current Prime Minister of Canada, I think now with the new government in Australia, you will once again see Australia resume its traditional place as one of Israel's great friends around the world. Uh, I have no doubt about that. Uh, I mentioned Germany. It, it can be hard for a group like this to process that, but Israel has no better friend in Europe and no more valuable friend in Europe than Germany. But Israel has other important friends in Europe too. And a number of them, again, may come as a surprise to some of you. Many of the former East European countries, countries like Poland, certainly the Czech Republic. The Czech Republic, pound for pound, may be the most pro-Israel country in the world. Romania, Bulgaria, I mentioned Greece. 
Cyprus is making a, an important shift towards Israel. Uh, India has a critically important relationship with Israel today. South Korea, Japan, I can keep going, uh, all have important relationships. I don't want to define them here because each one is specific, but the notion that some pedal that Israel is isolated politically, diplomatically, and strategically is something I reject. I, I, on the front lines of advocacy, I see day in and day out that even countries that vote against Israel in the United Nations bilaterally have robust relations with Israel very often. India is a perfectly good example. Look at the Indian voting record at the UN and you'll say, oi gavolt. Look at the bilateral relationship between India and Israel and you'll say, fantastic. And time permitting, I would explain the, the, the dichotomy. But focus on the, the important stuff, and the important stuff is bilateral, is what goes on between the two countries. It's not for AJC or any other uh, outside partner to draw the borders for Israel if Israel eventually agrees to a two-state agreement. It's for the parties themselves, and I mean in this case Israel. It's for Israel and its democratically elected government to draw the final borders that it believes are the, are the borders that make the most sense under the circumstances. I want to stress that point. It's for them. It's for them. They have to live with the consequences first and foremost, number one. But number two, I would say that in effect, I think you've seen the border of what a two-state agreement would look like if you simply follow the security barrier. It's very interesting when, when we get a lot of heat about the security barrier, or as some like to call it, the wall, because the wall has a more powerful um, thrust to it by Israel's adversaries, the wall. Uh, but if you follow the security barrier, you're essentially following what I think Israel has de facto said is what we believe our final border should be if there's going to be a two-state agreement. And we've told those who've, who've challenged the barrier, you're missing an important part of this conversation. You're, you're so focused on what you believe to be a new act of, a new act against the Palestinians. What you're actually seeing is Israel unilaterally defining, in some respects, what it believes it should look like. And everything on the other side, presumably, could end up in Palestinian hands one day. That's another way of looking at the security barrier. Um, so at the end of the day, it comes down to Israel and what they decide. And our job, I believe, is not to second guess the democratically elected government of Israel on the issues of war and peace. It's to be as supportive as we possibly can, whenever we can, on those issues where we feel comfortable supporting Israel. At the end of the day, we need to solve the Palestinian problem. We can't pretend it will go away. We can't pretend that even if we were right in the Peel Commission in 1937 and in 1947, that because we were right then, it will go away. It won't go away. And I think that's an illusion that some on the right have too long held. It won't go away. It won't somehow disappear. It won't magically be subsumed in the Hashemite kingdom of Jordan. It, it won't. It may one day subsume the Hashemite kingdom of Jordan. <laughs> but that's a different story. But there's also been a life of illusion on the left, which is no less problematic. And the life of illusion on the left has been that uh, at any moment in time, peace is obtainable but for Israel's intransigence, which in, in an earlier meeting with a few of you, I referred to as the IOI syndrome, the if only Israel syndrome. If only Israel pulled back from Jerusalem, if only Israel stopped building settlements, if only Israel had a reasonable government, et cetera, et cetera, then peace would dawn. And I'm sorry to say to my friends on the left that I don't buy it any more than I buy the narrative of those on the right who argue that um, 
but for a John Kerry, the Palestinians would disappear and just go away. And so I occupy a, a, a difficult centrist space which has to juggle two competing narratives at once. And by the way, the two competing narratives are not just the Israeli and Palestinian, they're my own. And one narrative is a narrative of hope and the other is a narrative of fear. And I, I, I coexist with both. I, I want to believe that one day a new King Hussein will emerge. One day a new Anwar Sadat will emerge who does not necessarily reflect a Zionist outlook but who understands a more fundamental issue even than that. That for the sake of their own people, forget Israel, for the sake of their own people, it's time to start focusing on building their countries and stop destroying Israel. For the sake of their own people, I don't expect <laughs> illustration, Gaza, 2005. The world saw, or at least the world could see if they were willing to look. Different story. The world saw a deep, divisive, difficult Israeli decision by the Prime Minister of Israel to remove up to 10,000 settlers from Gaza, forcibly if necessary, including the graves of those they buried, the greenhouses, the schools, the productive farms. And they removed the soldiers. And we all saw it. And the people of Gaza at that moment in time had two choices. They could aspire to become a Singapore, or they could aspire to become a Somalia. And they chose. And they chose. And again, for those in the world prepared to see, and we have a lot of visually impaired people in global diplomacy, but for those prepared to see, the people chose. They chose Somalia. And by choosing Somalia, they chose the destruction of Israel as more important to them than the construction of Gaza. They were given the choice. And you know, had they chosen the Singapore route, I have no doubt that billions of dollars would have flown from Europe, the United States, the IMF, the World Bank, private donors. You remember a group of Jewish, Jewish donors in the spirit of hope said, we're going to collect money and we're going to ensure that the greenhouses stay as a sign of a friendship and an investment because they're productive. We're going to give you the greenhouses to get started. We don't owe you anything, but we're doing this because we have a stake in you becoming Singapore. And what happened to the greenhouses? What happened to the So I can also write stories in the New Yorker, or at least, no, I can't. I, I wish I could. <laughs> but, but we can't live in an illusory world. It would be nice. But I can't want peace and construction and Singapore more for the residents of Gaza than they want it for themselves. I can want it. I can explain to them if they'll let me why I think it's not just in my interest, but in their interests. But ultimately, it's their decision. And they decided. And they decided. And what can I, as a friend of Israel, do in the face of their decision? It pains me. But I have no choice. I fully, totally, completely stand with the state of Israel against the threat of Hamas and all that it represents because they're committed to destruction much as I want to support a policy of construction. So let's stand together, folks, um, and let's draw strength from one another. And again, thank you so much for allowing me to speak here tonight.
We would be pleased to send a complimentary DVD of this program to anyone who wishes to support Shalom TV with a tax-deductible gift of $36, double high or more, to the nonprofit organization Jewish Education in Media. Simply visit the Shalom TV website homepage and click on the Donate button to make a donation by PayPal or your credit card. And please indicate the program for which you would like a DVD. Or you can send your tax-deductible check made out to GEM. To GEM, Post Office Box 180, Riverdale Station, Bronx, New York, 10471. And again, please remember to indicate which program you would like to receive on DVD with our compliments. And we thank you for your kind support.